How did it start? Okay, Minneapolis Speaker Recording Company started in 1948. So everything you see here, all of this is all built in Minneapolis. MISCO is one of the few OEM loudspeaker manufacturers left in the United States and probably the only loudspeaker manufacturer in the world that will manufacture a full range of speakers. 4 by 10, 6 by 9, 8 inch were some of our early, early uh, models, mainly the 8 inch. A lot of history here, a lot of history. After World War II, I came home from the military and I had planned to go on to uh, St. Cloud State Teachers College. But then during the war, I had flown as a radio operator. I flew, first of all, 17 missions as a ball turret gunner on a B-17. And then I flew six missions as a radio operator. And I came home and I met the head of hiring at Northwest Orient Airlines. And he said, you know what? He said, we can get you a job because we're going to have radio operators on our, our aircraft. And so, uh, but he said, you have to get your first class license. So I went to National Radio School. While I was in school, I brought this radio in because my wife had this before we were married. And she said, you know, it works fine for the first 10 minutes and then it becomes garbled. I brought it into the radio repair guy and he said, that's simple. He said, the speaker's bad. After a few minutes, the voice coil warms up and it rubs and it's distorted. So I said, so what do we do? He said, well, you buy a new speaker for four and a half, or you have this one recone for, th for a dollar and a half. And I said, well, simple for me too. You know, $3 in 1947, 48 was a lot of money. So I said, let's have it reconed. Okay, he said, we send it over to a company in St. Paul, and they recone it, and they'll pick it up here, bring it back. It may take two or three weeks or that darn busy. Well, two or three weeks went by, and never got it back. Five weeks went by, and never got it back. And I didn't live too far from this reconing service, so I stopped in myself, and he said, by God, I've lost it. So I even went through a scrap in a store and everything, and I couldn't find it. So I had to buy a new one. And I concluded right then, he needs competition. And so that's how I started Minneapolis Speaker Reconing Company, together with another instructor, with an instructor from National Radio School, who many people know, Raleigh Dibvig, Roald Dibvig. And uh, he, was, uh, he was my instructor. So he and I started Minneapolis Speaker Reconing Company. <music> Okay, so your business is now founded, and your first line of business was reconing. What was your process back then? This is 1949, 1950 for reconing, right? Okay. So where did these speakers come from? You know, what was the processing on these things? The first thing we had to do was to find sources of, of parts, the cones, the coils, the gaskets, the dust caps, and the different components that make up a speaker recon uh, reconing. Well, we started by contacting uh, Hawley products and Welsh products for cones, Ropac for gaskets, and all they would come back and say, you want to be in touch with Waldem Electronics. So we contacted Waldem, and Waldem said, I, we have a well-established company in St. Paul, and we're very happy with them, and uh, we're not looking for any more coverage in the Twin Cities. We think we have a franchise dealer and that's adequate. So uh, I don't give up too easily, nor did Raleigh. So we wrote back and said, we don't think he's doing a good enough job for you and we think we could do a better job. Or, and because we think a Minneapolis should have one franchise, St. Paul can have another. So Waldem came back and says, send us a business plan. Tell us what you plan to do. So Raleigh and I and a friend that came into the business named Don Fernman, we put together a plan. What were we going to do? 
I was going to be the internal man running the company. Raleigh was going to give the technical support that he was from the school. Fernland was going to be out soliciting business. He was working for a different company at that time. So after a lot of persuasion, Walden finally agreed to give us a franchise. So we got the Minneapolis franchise for Speaker Recoin. Okay, so you went to Waldem, and now did Waldem require any special training, or did they just send you up parts, or how did that work? Well, it helped that Raleigh Dibvig was an instructor at a school, and Raleigh had a vast knowledge of loudspeakers and of electronics per se. But Waldem still says, you'll have to come to Chicago for a day or two to be trained into speaker reconing. How to recon a speaker, what's the process? and to get parts. And they gave us a list of parts that we would have to get from them, and then they would ship that to us later. So then there was a, a relatively a cold, wintry day when Buddy, my, oh, we had, by this time we hired one employee, Vernon Matheson, he's my cousin, but very, very mechanical. So we hired him on a program where the government paid part of his wages, we paid part of his wages. It was just after the war, he's a serviceman. So he and I drove to Chicago on a cold, blustery day. We drove straight through, checked into a hotel at about two in the morning, and went to Waldem, and we worked there until about six in the evening, got back in our car, and drove back to Minneapolis after that trip. So that was how we learned about the speaker recording. So what did they teach you down there? Well, they, they actually had speakers from, most of them were from radio shops, ra radio speakers, car radio speakers. And uh, they taught us how, how to take out the parts. We would disassemble, rip out the cone, take out the uh, different components to make it up, submerge the piece speaker into a pan of water, warm water, uh, because uh, uh, they didn't want to use acetones at this time, it was inflammable. So they soaked them in water, and then we stood with a, not with a um, chisel, a uh, uh, cold chisel afterwards, and we scraped the damn parts out of the speaker. And that was the process of cleaning it. Now then we go into the process of putting the speaker back together. We pick a coil, insert the coil into the air gap, check the clearance, to make sure you've got clearance, insert a spider around the coil to hold it uh, in position. Then the cone came in, the gasket, and then finally after it dried, then the, uh, uh, the, uh, the leads were soldered onto here. And then a dust cap put in place. So it was relatively, we thought it was complicated at the time, but of course in retrospect, it was a very simple process. Well, that came along by the recording. Wright de Coster, an old, old name in loudspeaker manufacturing, was in St. Paul. Uh, there at on University Avenue near Vandalia. The sign at the top of the building still says Wright Incorporated. Mr. de Coster and Mr. Wright started this company. Mr. de Coster was, as I've heard tell, was the engineer of the company, and Mr. Wright was the salesperson. Well, Mr. De Coster died suddenly at a young age of like less than 40 years old, and his family chose not to continue in the speaker business, and they sold out his share to Mr. Wright. Well, Mr. Wright didn't have a fondness for manufacturing, so he went on the open market and bought speakers from Jensen, from Quam, from Utah, and he'd put his labels on them. And one day, we had reconed many, many speakers for him. One day he said, Cliff, you know, of the hundreds of speakers you've reconed, he said, I've never had a reject. He said, why don't you just sign one eight inch for me? Give me the, give me the quality you're doing in your reconing. And so I scrounged, I went to Chicago and I found the suppliers for these different parts. I found the basket company, I found the, the cone company, I found the gasket company and so on. And so I came back and I made him up some prototypes. And he said, this is what we want. So he said, I'm going to give you an order for, I think it was 100. And I, God, I thought, I've died and gone to heaven. 100 speakers, see. 
So I made that 100. He said, Cliff, we've got a winner. I'm going to give you an order for 200. And so it went for 200, and I built those. Finally, he said, Cliff, I got a real, I've never had a reject from you. I'm going to give you an order for 500. Wow, by now I really was high. <laughs> so we uh, started building the 500, and he called up and uh, he said, Oh, we started building the 500. Yeah, we've gone through the 100, the 200, and just started the 500 when his secretary called me uh, just after Christmas, I think, in 1954, 55. I have the dates in there. And she said, I'm sorry to inform you, Cliff, but Mr. Wright passed away this weekend, and we're canceling all our orders. So I know you just got these parts in, but you'll have to do the best you can. So I took speaker under arm, went downtown, went to Harry Stark. He bought few. Went to Electronic Center. Jerry and Ward uh, Jensen, they bought a few. I went to uh, uh, Northwest Electronics, Dave Good, he bought a few. Lou Bond bought a few. M mainly they were feeling sorry for poor Cliff. They knew, they'd heard the story that I was stuck with these. So uh, they all felt sorry for me. Pretty soon they called back and said, Cliff, that's a heck of a speaker. Uh, give me a dozen, you know. So pretty soon I was rid of the 500, whatever, ahead. And I thought, by golly, this is great. So, but they said you need a, um, you need to have a diversified line. You need a six by nine. I just had the eight inch. So I said, well, okay. Well, so we went back through Chicago, got the parts, and pretty soon we were building a six by nine, and then a four by ten, and different sizes for automobiles. One day I was calling on, on Harry Stark. And Harry said, what are you, Cliff, another Me Too? And he said, you, all speakers got a black hole, a gray spider, or gray uh, dust cap, white gasket, it looked, all looked the same. And that just bugged the crap out of me. So I went back home, started thinking about that. And I said, you know what? I'm going to make my cones out of red. And I developed the red line, which this is, a red cone. And uh, thus was born the red line of speakers. And we were the first manufacturer in the world, probably, that had a complete line of speakers with uh, a colored cone, with red cones. So, proud of that. Please replace the speaker on its rack when you're ready to leave. Failure to do so will damage both the speaker and your car. We'll be grateful, and so will the patrons who follow you. As when television came into being in the late, uh, early 50s, late 40s, uh, I knew there was going to be a sh uh, not too many radios fixed anymore. Television was going to all be brand new. So I said, what's the market we should pursue? So I went after the drive-in theater. And uh, this is a speaker out of the drive-in theater speakers. This is a drive-in, this is an RCA, that's a classic designed for a drive-in theater speaker. But then with drive-ins, we treated drive-ins pretty much like a production basis. We got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. For a time, we were the largest speaker recording company in the United States because of what we did in drive-ins. I, I went to drive-in theater conventions in Milwaukee, and Cleveland, Cincinnati. I'd drive my car, <laughs> and I spent nights driving and get back to work to fix them up again. So drive-ins were big business for us. Then we said, you know, we can make, this was a darn big clumsy unit, and I'm going to design a drive-in theater speaker, smaller, and less cumbersome. See, when these would uh, uh, go onto the windows, and they would drive away. So the windows would get, even get broken. Then they, oh, God, they, the kids would pour pop down here, and, but they were kind of clumsy, and, and they steal them. The kids would cut this off, the wire here. So they just signed a cord called, with a steel cable in it. <laughs> and in the cord, then they couldn't cut them. Uh, but they ruined the speaker in the meantime. But then they would break the window if they drive off, or they'd hook onto the fender because those cables were so darn strong. Well, I came up with a much smaller version 
it was adequate, adequate sound. And this, this really was a good little speaker here. We sold that complete, 395. There you can see the back of it here, the, where the wind hung on the windows. Then I started making the speakers for the drive-in, uh, for other drive-in manufacturers. Like this is one of our speakers right here that we made. So I started making a series of three and a half inch, four inch, five inch, six inch, all the sizes for drive-in theaters, designing them with cloth cones. So uh, as this is right here, that's a cloth cone. And we worked with the other cone manufacturers to come up with a design on that. Aluminum voice coils that wouldn't, wouldn't shrink. So, and weatherproof gaskets soaked in, uh, uh, not as weatherproof as you could now, but uh, at that time it's about the best we could do. Acquaintances that I had in Reconi, Forrest Riney and his wife Dorothy, delightful people, delightful people. Chuck Underhill, his wife Deanie, uh, Harold Simonson, uh, John Hemack, the Polish guy from Northeast Minneapolis, Chuck Eklund. Now he was the dean. He was a dean of the service industry. Uh, most of the others that I mentioned were ma and pa operations, like, like uh, Forrest and Dorothy and Chuck and Deanie and the others. They were more ma and pa operations, but Chuck was a pretty sophisticated and a very well-educated man and just one heck of a nice guy. And he kind of had the respect for the whole industry as somebody very special. And if you knew him, you know what I'm talking about. Rad Williams? Oh. Flash Radio, nobody better. They were one of my customers. I go on, I got customers. I remember the day I got the Beneke Company from St. Paul. They were the prestige, they were the Chuck Ecklins of St. Paul. And to crack that account, that was a good one. So reconing was really important to me. And that's how I gained my knowledge of loudspeakers. I have personally repaired every single loudspeaker ever made up to that point.